let the screen populate. All right. Look at all those faces. Hey, everybody. Hey, good to see some of you. Recognize a few. Um, while we're waiting for the stragglers to come real quick, if you'd like to introduce yourself, um, you can put your name and where you're from in the chat. And that way um, we get a little bit of sense of how uh, widespread we are across the state and who's here tonight. Um, I, I, see some, I see our celebrities, Dick and Kristen have made it tonight. Wave to the fans. <laughs> All right. Yeah, if you're part of an indivisible group, please, you can include that information as well. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to uh, just do kind of a basic introduction. Uh, my name is Terry Martin, and I'm part of the leadership of COIN, which is the Consolidated Oregon Indivisible Network. Um, we are a coalition of about 45 indivisible groups across the state of Oregon. Um, we have been organized for, I'd say, the last three years. We sort of came together um, during the midterm elections to work on things together and found that we like each other so much that we just keep meeting um, and we do great things together. Um, a lot of our groups are far flung. We, I think we have about 20 of the groups in District 2, which is uh, represented by uh, Congressman Bentz. And so we have groups that are flung way out in the, the far corners of Oregon, as well as a, uh, a core of indivisible groups in the Portland area and down I-5. Um, I am also part of the steering committee for ORD2 Indivisible in Jackson County. Um, and I was also a candidate for Jackson County Commissioner last year when the fires uh, raged through Oregon and took out about 2,800 homes and 200 businesses in Jackson County. And one of those businesses was mine. Um, I'm part of a, a Harley Davidson family. Uh, my family's owned a dealership here for, it is now 50 years as of this year. This was gonna be our big party to celebrate and instead we lost the entire, the entire thing, everything except for uh, the business server and a hose that was connected to a bib in the back. So, um, so that's my perspective on this is actually um, living through this and spending the last year learning how to recover from this. But we have invited tonight four panelists who have been working on solutions. Um, and I'd like to briefly introduce them and then I'm gonna give them a couple of minutes each to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about how they fit into this puzzle of Oregon wildfires. Um, I'm gonna ask that everyone keep yourselves on mute, please, um, unless you're called on to speak. If we have a lot of questions that people have submitted and we'll try to get to those as soon as we can um, or in, during the course of the discussion. But I will say that I'm, I'm an old teacher from SOU and I know that sometimes discussions go in surprising and wonderful directions. So I'm really flexible in terms of um, what we come up with in terms of what we've learned from these fires that happened last year or are happening now um, and how we go forward. So our four panelists are, we have Jamie McLeod Skinner, who was a congressional candidate. That's how we all got to know her first. Um, and is a, uh, everything from a, a, sm a small farm owner to um, current, was recently a, a city planner, I guess, for City of Talent, which was recovering from the fire. We have Representative Daisha Graber, who is um, state rep for House District 35 in the Portland area. We have Corinna Miller, who is vice chair from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. And we have Phil Chang, who's a Deschutes County Commissioner. All right, I'm gonna give each of you a couple of minutes to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about you. And I will start with Jamie. Well, hey, everybody. It's so great to see so many friendly faces and folks from all around the state. Uh, good to see you. And thanks for the opportunity to to uh, join you in this conversation. Really delighted to be part of this conversation um, with some really amazing folks. So I'm an Ashland High School graduate. Uh, my wife and I now live in, in Central Oregon. Uh, we're just outside Terrebonne Crooked River Ranch, about an hour north of Bend. 
My background is in civil engineering, uh, regional planning. I'm actually a certified um, a planner. Also in uh, natural resource law. So I'm an attorney with the, the Oregon Bar. Um, when I uh, studied uh, leadership um, for the Oxford Human Rights, it was looking at things like climate refugees and some of the impacts on uh, climate change having on communities. And then also through the Harvard Executive Pro uh, Program, we really use that, the, um, the study model to respond to crises. And so that's some of the background I have as well as being a mediator uh, for policy. I spent eight years on the Santa Clara City Council. I was the, the CD2, uh, the, the Democratic nominee for CD2 in 2018, as mentioned. We actually had the big, biggest voter uh, swing in the country, in any congressional district in the country, because of, of many of you, so thank you. I also serve on the Jefferson County Education Service District Board. In terms of my municipal background, I worked as a, as a planner in uh, for Sunnyvale. Um, I served on the Santa Clara City Council in Silicon Valley. I was working on policy issues there. Um, worked for the Santa Clara Valley Water District as an environmental planner, and then worked, I was actually the interim city manager in talent just recently from January to June, helping on wildfire recovery. My background in emergency relief, I worked in Bosnia and Kosovo just after the war. And then also, um, uh, as mentioned, in helped on the recovery and talent. And then currently I'm working on drought issues, actually also with Commissioner Chang and on leadership development also with Karina Miller. So it's good to be a part of this conversation. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Disha. Thank you. And I feel a little left out. I'm not working with Jamie on anything currently, so maybe we have to fix that. Uh, my name is Dacia Graber, and I am the state representative for House District 35, which is Tigard and Southwest Portland. Um, I come to that kind of through a circuitous path. I never, as a kid, was like, oh, I want to grow up and be a politician. No, I wanted to grow up and be a firefighter, so I managed to do both. I've been a firefighter for 20 years now. I've worked everywhere from small volunteer departments on a rural island off the coast of Washington to a city department, and now I'm with a department with about 500 personnel. Um, I'm on the secondary wildland deployment team, and unfortunately, I was part of, I wasn't down in Southern Oregon, but in Clackamas County and Chehalem Mountain in the Labor Day fires from last year. Uh, I ran for office because of all the things that I experienced as, as a firefighter, mostly, you know, working and seeing folks that didn't have access to health care and generational trauma and systemic poverty. But really talk about being in the right place at the right time. So here I get elected in 2020, right after these fires. And once again, you know, the, the major policy work that had been bubbling up for years comes to the surface. And so I was very fortunate to be able to take a pivotal role in Senate Bill 762, which was probably one of the most um, undernoticed at the time, but hard fought bills to come out of the legislative session and we did get it done. So very excited about that and would love to touch on that. Um, but I'm just so grateful for everyone being here on a beautiful Tuesday evening. Thank you. Welcome. Karina. Mich Klawe, Inknashmaniksha, Karina Miller. I am from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. I served on the 27th Warm Springs Tribal Council from 2016 to 2019. Um, and I've actually um, been serving as the vice chair of the Columbia River Gorge Commission for the last year. And so spending time in these areas, looking at the wildfires that have been happening there and how they've been impacting those areas, but really I'm just here because of that experience of being on our tribal council and looking at um, tribal impacts of wildfires. I also do work through Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, which is a regional organization that has a climate change program. And so the tribe I am at, Warm Springs, we don't actually have a climate change program or any sort of thing that is being proactive about wildfire impacts or mitigation. We're really, um, struggling to keep up with capacity for how we're being impacted every year. And so I think just bringing that perspective of not just what's happening and how's it impacting communities like ours, but also what are the bigger system issues and how do we start addressing them through things like, you know, for our tribe, we did do a carbon project through a California cap and trade market. How do we be more proactive about the natural resources we have and the ways that we're trying to combat climate, I guess, climate change. So um, that's really what I'm here for. And, you know, like it's already been said, I'm just really appreciative to everyone who are on this call, because I think 
these deeper conversations and just continuing conversations is sometimes hard to do. So I was happy to see a lot of rural um, Oregonians here on this conversation because I think this is really where we have solutions and figure out, get on the same page of how are we being impacted and what kind of things do we really prioritize. And I'm excited to also just hear from the other experts here on this panel and very honored to be included. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Phil. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm, Desch I'm Deschutes County Commissioner Phil Chang. I had many past lives uh, dealing with wildfire and forest management before being elected uh, this last year. Um, a couple of the things I've done, uh, I helped to build the forest collaboratives that work on the Deschutes and the Ochoco National Forests. Uh, so basically that entailed bringing together environmentalists, timber industry people, firefighters, and lots of other stakeholders to plan and help implement restoration projects on our national forests, which make them more resilient, improve habitat for um, you know, species that have, that have suffered um, with the transformation of our forests, our dry forests in Eastern Oregon over the last um, 100 years. Um, these treatments also reduce risks uh, to our communities and create jobs. Uh, I also served as a congressional staffer for uh, Senator Merkley for three and a half years. Um, so was involved in uh, doing policy analysis and providing advice on uh, federal forest management issues. <clears throat> and then most recently before running for office, I, I ran uh, the state of Oregon's federal forest restoration program. Um, so the, the work of that program is to deploy state resources, both, both people and funds to help restore our national forest and, and BLM forest lands. Um, I, through that job, which was a, a statewide job, I learned a lot, not just about the dry forest ecosystems that you know, are very familiar to me in, uh, in Eastern Oregon, but also about uh, west side wet forest ecosystems and, and other parts of the state. So um, one of the things I, I, I will expect that we, we should talk about at some point during the, uh, during the panel today is how Eastern Oregon, how dry forests and wet forests are really different. Um, wildfire behaves really differently in them. Restoration means completely different things in those forest ecosystems. So um, just want to flag that. Uh, but I, I will also say that I am a, uh, what I hope to be able to contribute to this panel is some uh, really meaningful perspective on how you can do uh, active restoration, active fuels reduction work in dry forest ecosystems and how that really does make a difference, um, both for, um, you know, wildfire resiliency and uh, giving firefighters the best shot they can uh, to contain fires, but also um, for the health of the, of the forest ecosystem. Uh, you know, I don't think um, the, the most hardcore environmental activists that I know um, probably have a very similar vision of what our forests here in, in Eastern Oregon should look like. Um, large, widely spaced, early cereal trees, mostly pine, um, with uh, lots of grassy and uh, grassy understory, uh, not a dense wall of small trees and a whole bunch of shrubs in the understory. Um, a, a really, um, um, there, there's a, a particular structure, species composition and function um, to these Eastern Oregon forest ecosystems. And we are, uh, the, the, the forests we are living with right now are extremely departed um, from that historic structure function and, and composition. Uh, so uh, I, I have the perspective of um, seeing active restoration, transforming these highly altered forests uh, and putting them back on a trajectory to become uh, more like the historical, more resilient forests that we had um, for millennia. Uh, before European American settlement in in, in this area, uh, so well, we'd love to chat about that at some point during the during the panel. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, the four panelists, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and unmute them yourselves for this part because I feel like this needs to be a discussion. I don't want to take a question and just pitch it at one person because I want all of us to to combine our our um, forces here, our experience, and our expertise. 
Um, who is someone sharing? There we go. Okay, <laughs> we're back. All right. Um, and so I guess the, to start with, um, what I'd really like to ask is what are the factors that we're dealing with when it comes to wildfires across the state right now? I know because we're talking, we've got forests, we've got urban wildfires, we've got we've got factors that we have to deal with. We could identify those and like, I, you know, my, I'm going to go in my teaching mode, but I was in front of my whiteboard. What are the factors that we really have to pay attention to going forward? Go. Are you, are, you, um, are you asking what are the factors that contribute to dangerous fires being dangerous? Or are you talking about what do we what factors do we need to think about in terms of being, you know, our communities being resilient to fire? Well, I would think what factors do we, if we had to put a list of, of risks, what, what, is the, what are the things we have to look at directly to prevent wildfires from happening, both in the forest and in the urban setting? What are the things, what are the factors we need to look at as a community and as individuals? That's a great question, Terry, and I, I'll just jump in and say I've been responding to large wildland fires for 20 years now, and, you know, I, I think it was 19... Or no, 2003, I deployed on something called the School Fire, which was in Southeast Washington. And at the time that was the largest fire of its kind. And it was extreme fire behavior. And now that is our normal fire. That is, that's become our norm. So from my perspective, the things that I've seen, you know, obviously climate change is at the forefront, but also where we're building our homes. Um, the, the state that our forests are in, you know, I know Phil has a lot to say on that, but I just want to say that those conditions have been there and they've been accelerating incredibly rapidly over the last 20 years. But uh, I don't want to pass it off to someone else. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, I, it's uh, adaptation and mitigation. So climate change and, and the language we use, of course, in rural areas is really talking about flooding or wildfire or, or drought, which is, is a huge factor here. Um, we're in a 20 year uh, mega drought right now, the entire Western United States has been in. And so it's only gonna, it's in the process of getting worse, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, the point of, um, uh, Rep Graber's point of we, this is a reality we're having to deal with now. And so it's everything from how we build and use land use, how we manage the resources we have, um, and also how we prepare ourselves on an individual level, because uh, we can't assume that if there is a wildfire, if we're burnt out of our homes, and we saw that in Southern Oregon, that you know the state or federal government will swoop in and take care of everything. We have to be prepared uh, from the family level on up to the community level, and then also county, state, um, and then just be willing to adapt as needed. So, you know, there was one question that came in early about, do we focus on the big picture climate change or do we focus on local issues? We have to do it all. We don't have the luxury of doing either or. Um, no. I think a, a really important starting point um, is to recognize that fire is an integral part of the landscape that we aim at. Um, uh, so there's there is no there is no preventing fire uh, from from our you know from um, visiting our forests and if our communities sprawl into that forest there's there's no way of preventing fire from visiting our communities either um, the the fire return interval uh, the natural or kind of historic fire return interval um, really varies across the state here and here in uh, on the east side of the Cascades in the Ponderosa pine forest uh, system, historically fires would burn through um, you know, any given acre of, of forest every, every seven, 10, 15 years, extremely frequent. Um, in the wetter forest on the, on the west side of the state, uh, fi the fire return interval is much longer. You, know, you might have an average fire return interval of you know, 60, 80, you know, even 100 years. But uh, just because that's a longer return interval, it doesn't mean that um, it, it's not it, it uh, that there isn't going to be a return. <laughs> it's uh, it, it will happen, and and unfortunately, one of the things that we understand be, uh, uh, when you think about the fire return interval is that you know Western Oregon forests, because they have such a long period between fires historically. Uh, a, a tremendous amount of fuel built up. And so the, the natural 
the natural fire in a Western Oregon forest ecosystem is a high severity stand replacing fire. Um, so if you want to avoid that outcome, um, you, you, need to, uh, you need to do some serious, serious um, manipulation of the environment uh, to insulate yourself from that. Um, or you need to be prepared for, uh, you know, essentially catastrophic fire events uh, visiting your, your community on that kind of uh, frequency. When you say we, Phil, I mean, what is it? I can't remember the, the number of, of the higher percentage of what government owned land is in Oregon. It's huge, right? So isn't it mostly federal land uh, in the state of Oregon? And it, is the federal government doing what it needs to do? Um, in Oregon, I want to say 60% of the forest land is federally owned. Right. Um, so that means 40% is not. Um, okay. And the 60% the that's federally owned is way out in the boondocks. <laughs> so, um, you know, we have a lot of it here in the eastern part of the state. So uh, there is a lot of uh, private, uh, private uh, forest land ownership uh, surrounding our communities, both um, industrial, you know, private industrial forest ownership, and also non-industrial uh, forest landowners. So, uh, but but yeah, there's definitely different scales to think about in terms of fuels. We need to think about um, the the forests broadly. Um, but as you get, you know, the, the the part we care about the most is the part that's close to our homes. Um, and um, each of you know anyone who owns a uh, single family home on a on a lot. Um, has, uh, is responsible for uh, a certain amount of fuel uh, on the landscape. And oftentimes it's that fuel surrounding your home um, that is most predictive of whether your house is gonna survive a fire or not. So that there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of responsibility that falls on yeah, every homeowner um, or uh, you know, landowner who rents, the, <laughs> rents a property to someone else um, to uh, think about the the fire resiliency uh, of of their landscape and their house. I, I mean, <laughs> um, houses are fuel, um, and uh, you know, as we've seen in, in 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 some of the recent, you know, the, the Paradise Fire in California, some of the some of the fires that burned in Southwest Oregon, um, a, you know, a, a, a house can transfer fire from you know this house to the other house just as easily as a, a set of trees can transfer fire from this house to the other house. So, um, you know, that uh, everything, everything is potentially fuel. Which we saw in the Alameda fire down here, of course, even just among mobile homes. I didn't realize that mobile homes would burn so easily. I just assumed that they were metal, you know? <laughs> and yeah. at this point, it was, it was such a shock, I think, to, to think of that. Um, in terms of doing the work, and we, the, you're talking about different levels of work. The federal government has its responsibilities. The counties have its responsibilities. We have individual responsibilities. And then there's the state too. Um, we've had a one year to process after these major fires last year. Are we doing the work on all the different levels? Well, there's also tribal governments and I'll kick that over to Karina. Okay. Um, to even Karina, if you wanna get a chance to answer that, that first question. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you, Jamie. So I think this is where I'm trying to also just listen because there are other perspectives and expertise in the room and people who have been boots on the ground responding to fires and that's always important. So my experience really only comes from that of being a tribal leader and understanding for tribes how it's impacted us as far as capacity wise with how we manage our natural resources. And, and looking at exactly what Jamie just said, there are local jurisdictions, state, federal, but tribal governments are often extremely misunderstood and were really set up to not exist throughout today. And so my experience has been just kind of um, processing, I guess, the, the way that we're set up to be reactionary to everything. And so for me, I know we're trying to talk about the first question was really what should we be focusing on? And it's hard because the reality is that wildfires are just, as we've heard from Representative uh, Deisha, sorry. <laughs> Um, but that the wildfires are so extreme now. We all understand that, that fires that were considered really dangerous and, and really violent in the past are now the norm. And we even look at how much smoke there always is. I know for the community, I grew up in Warm Springs, we're the largest reservation in Oregon. And so 
we have a huge natural resources department that does a lot of the fire um, you know, the damage that fires cause on our, our restoration projects, on our land management, all, as well as our timber. And we have a fire management department. So there's these different layers of what I could talk about as far as, you know, I think that the reality for a lot of tribes are if we're going to focus on things, it needs to be the bigger picture. And there's not enough time and there's not enough conversations for us to be able to really dissect and break down the ways that tribal governments are cornered into having economies where environment and money are coupled and we have no choice but to use our resources to provide revenue. But when you really understand how these are all set up, we're forced into this, but we're also forced to be some of the first protectors of the land and the animals. And so when you break it down, you know, the way we fund everything, the way our staff work, we're really working on protecting all of these lands in the state, doing fire management, our firefighters are trained, and they go off a lot away from the reservation, spend all this time fighting for other lands, um, but we don't have those same resources for our people. And so this is why when we were on tribal council, we looked at carbon markets. We looked at how do we talk about capitalism in a different way? How do we talk about land, you know, our tribal land is designated. People don't understand all those things in the history of land law and why it all ties together. And so we're obviously going to continue to have to mitigate what wildfires are doing now and do more, you know, burning to get rid of fuels, do more fire prevention around neighborhoods, homes, be conscious about where we're building, all those sort of things. But we do, uh, in my opinion, also need to take a bigger look at those systems that are causing these situations where, you know, from the Oregon Clean Energy Jobs Bill, we know the top 100 polluters, utilities, corporations, and transportation. And so how many of those things can we change as a society? How many things about the way our utilities are renewable? How can we get real about what's performative and what's transformative? And so the, I'll stop there. I think I'm getting mucking up, but that's my answer for the first question. So thanks for giving me that space, Jamie. Thanks. Appreciate that. Terry, I think I can tag in a little bit on what the state's been doing. That's, okay. that's definitely my lane. I also want to kind of shout out quickly to Karina. Um, there's a lot that we have to learn in fire management from our tribal communities. I mean, this is, they're, they're, if you look at the campfire, they talk about tribal management in Northern California before before it was colonized essentially. And um, where I worked up in the San Juan Islands, it's it's a small thing, but those lands were traditionally managed and burned for camas and it was very effective fuel management. So that conversation needs to happen on a very fundamental level. Um, and a different lane, the state level, I am unequivocal about saying that the work that we performed at the state this year, that bill that we got done needed to happen 10 years ago to see the change that we need right now. So it's not, I mean, it feels like too little too late. I mean, I had a lot of questions when the bootleg fire kicked up, like why is this happening when you just passed this wild wildfire bill? Well, these things need time. So Oregon was the last state to really uh, enter into the wildland urban interface concept. And that's something, and that's something that's still being fought out in rules right now is what the definition of the WUI is. It's called the WUI, it's a great word to say, riles a lot of people up. Um, but, you know, we did have $125 million earmarked for, for pre-positioning teams in places. And that's a hard thing when we look at some of the fire science, because these really, just to back up to that first question too, one of the things that I've seen that's been the most impressive to me this year and last year is normally west of the Cascades, we have a relative humidity in the summertime. Um, a low humidity for us is 40 to 45% and we average around 60. I think there are more days than not this summer that have been 2018. And for us, that's explosive. That's catastrophic relative humidity. It means our fuels are drier. So, um, you know, backing up to that, that's why we have this immediate strong response from our state, state forestry and why we're putting those fires out. Now, as Phil can tell you, putting those fires out, in some cases, those fires need to burn to, to mitigate, but it's when it butts up into communities and when it's, you know, we're in this vicious cycle where we're like, no, put them all out, no, let them burn. Um, and, and that's where we're trying to find the balance. And that's why a lot of the conversation now is transferring to fire resistant communities because there's, there's amazing, and I'll stop after this, but there's really incredible science coming out of the bootleg fire that um, Ralph Bloomers and some other folks are doing, looking at like what the actual burn patterns were and finding that 
um, you know, places that had been logged that were second growth that were managed, they burned just as hot and fast as forests that weren't managed. And that's a really hard thing for people to wrap their minds around. So when we're looking at something that's so explosive like that, where's the path forward? And there's a lot of research saying it's in how we build our communities. So to follow up the, the bill that you were talking about, what was what did it do? If you had to sum it up, I mean, because I know it's a, uh, lot, a big piece of the making, right? <laughs> Senate Bill 762 is 30, uh, 33 very dense pages. It's it's all encompassing. It talks about response dollars. Um, it hold, talks about holding energy producers accountable. It talks about establishing a workforce, a conservation workforce. It's identifying the WUI, doing risk mapping. That's really exciting. That'll be done through OSU. That's going to affect the entire state and be available for free to the entire state. And it puts everything into a wildfire policy council, which is being, um, I think they're appointing currently. They, they just, they haven't announced who's on that yet, but it's going to be, and I, off the top of my head, I wanna say 19 different representatives from different areas, including tribal environmental groups, logging industry. So it's trying to bring everyone to that conversation. Thank you. I knew it was a huge bill. I was trying to track it. There was <laughs> yeah. so much going on that I, I just kept being, had to keep uh, relying on our representative to translate it for me, right? Um, Phil, why don't you talk about what's happening on the county level? I mean, since you're with the, um, you know, your county commissioner, I mean, what, what, what responsibility do county commissioners have in this role? Um, well, Deschutes County has taken a very proactive role in trying to create fire resilient communities, fire adapted communities. So we offer uh, both a tremendous amount of technical assistance to uh, private landowners. Um, and also uh, we make opportunity, we, we try to make it easy for them in, in, in various ways to do defensible space around their homes. Um, so, you know, a, a simple example is we will run uh, what's, what, are, what we call fire-free events at the county landfill uh, where people can, you know, uh, you know, limb up their trees, deal with the brush, get rid of the pine needles and, and leaves, um, you know, load up the truck, bring it to the, bring it to the landfill and put it in the big compost pile. Um, so that th those materials aren't on your landscape, you know, when fire season starts. Um, the, there's also, uh, we do a, a similar kind of thing where we uh, set up opportunities for, for people to just put a big heap of stuff on, at their curbside once a year uh, in some of the um, uh, fire safe USA designated communities, you know, the, the, these communities can sign up for a certain amount of education and support in getting a lot of work done in their neighborhood. Um, and then we, we try to support them, not, in, not just in, in uh, becoming fire safe communities, but also in uh, you know, implementing the work that, that, that comes along with that. Um, so there's, there are those pieces. Uh, I'm, uh, our, we've had a county commissioner sit on the, the um, the steering committee of our, our forest collaborative um, for pretty much the, the whole time that it's existed. And um, the, the, the role of the commissioner or the role of the, you know, the elected leader there is to uh, try to keep those folks, um, you know, who, who fought each other for decades in, in you know, in, the, in court and in other places, the, the timber industry people, the environmentalists, um, the, 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 the firefighters, uh, sometimes recreationists. You know, we have a lot of recreational use in our national forest here, and those people um, can get upset if somebody's, you know, thinning trees or you know, setting a prescribed fire next to their trail or things like that. So, uh, you know, part of our job at the collaborative is just to keep all these people um, on the same page and rowing in the same direction, um, and because it took a it took a long time to get all those people to to figure out what they could agree on, you know, and they don't agree on everything, but there is a zone of agreement. And, and so, you know, my job, now I'm serving as one of the co-chairs of our collaborative. My, my job is to, is to gently and positively uh, enforce 
the collaborative agreements that people have come to and, and bring, constantly bring them back to that um, so that the, the work can go forward in uh, our national forests. Um, I did just to kind of uh, touch on something that you asked about earlier, Terry, um, to give people a sense of how our federal land managers are doing uh, with their, their fuel management um, work. Um, uh, my forest, the Deschutes National Forest, um, which is a reasonably well-resourced, you know, like a incredibly professionally staffed national forest, we are hundreds of thousands of acres behind. Um, we have over 100,000 acres of prescribed burns um, that are through the environmental review process, through the NEPA process. We haven't implemented them yet. We have over 100,000 acres of mechanical treatments, you know, non-commercial thinning, commercial thinning, brush mowing, things like that, that haven't been, that haven't been implemented yet. Um, funding is the big, uh, is the major constraint on that. But also when, when you get to stuff like prescribed burns, there's also these really challenging burn windows where you, know, you, you, you need to burn during just the right conditions, otherwise the fire will escape. And you also, uh, when you're next to the city of Bend, you need to burn when the wind isn't blowing into Bend, otherwise DEQ will shut you down. So it leaves very few days for us to get the prescribed fires done. And Phil, what about development? I mean, to me, um, this is a big, a big deal in, in Jackson County right now, allowing homes to be built up into the hills. I mean, I live up a canyon that's very dry, um, right. was evacuated that night. And so I, and, but I know that there's nine new homes going in above me on the hill. And I'm thinking the, the county commissioners have to be dealing with that too, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are, we are all blessed to live in the state of Oregon, which has a land use system that that naturally seeks to constrain the wildland, wildland urban interface. Okay. Um, that said, um, that land use system was passed in the 1960s um, after a whole bunch of, uh, my, my county was already parcelized, you know, and people now have vested property rights to, you know, you own, you own five acres of rural residential out in the county you have a right to build a house on that. And if we, if we try to prevent that, um, those people will, you know, they'll, um, they'll come out, come after us, after us with a measure 49 loss. So, um, right. you know, and, and, you know, accuse us of taking. So uh, if there is this, you know, established pattern of land ownership uh, and people have rights to develop the best thing, the, the, the best things we can do are um, make sure they have, defensible space around their homes, and they build their homes out of the most fire resilient materials possible. And that's, um, uh, Rep, Rep Graber, I, I, I don't think mentioned those two specific little, these are little bitty pieces of SB 762. But, you know, from my perspective, as a county commissioner, those are two of the hugest parts of that piece of legislation. Um, people who live in, you um, and uh, you know wildfire hazard zones, and I, I expect that most of my county is going to be designated wildfire hazard zone. Um, the people who live in those wildfire hazard zones will be required to uh, create defensible space around their homes and to build new homes or you know major remodels with the most fire resilient building materials possible. That's a perfect segue to get to Jamie to talk about what happens on the city level at this point. Um, well, because that's a whole new level. Yeah, so, uh, but the city also interacts with all levels. So actually one thing I'll even mention and just give kind of a city perspective on the, the state and county um, as well. And also actually the federal level. So FEMA is well known, but FEMA actually had some learning and adapting. One of the things that we worked on really hard in talent is to make sure that FEMA is being responsive to our farm worker population um, and helping to on engagement, some of those things. So there's that learning opportunity at the federal level as well. Um, at the state level, I mean, the big piece is making resources available. And the state did that for talent. And actually, I remember Rep Graber, when I was testifying, her on there and nodding. And they and they got us, um, I think, about $5 million for for talent on water security and then also for um, some uh, community preparedness, uh, some other measures as well. So uh, thanks to Rep Graber for that. Um, and also allocations to the e-board. So that kind of planning and allocation piece, Phil also mentioned it, uh, that that um, the state has gone into. That's the prep work. Cause then they, when you, the e-board, the, the um, 
emergency board has access to those resources as the, the wildfire and the drought that's going on right now across the state, those resources are available. So that's really important. The other key thing, and we saw this in Southern Oregon, is to really invest in the community-based organizations and build their capacity because those are the on-the-ground response organizations. So yes, cities, but when you're really talking about communities, you're also talking about community-based organizations. You know, UNITE and Northwest Seasonal Workers down in, in Southern Oregon, critical organizations that were there uh, you know, the day after the fire, I was calling friends and and um, uh, uh, Dagoberto was actually in line at a grocery store buying a family some food at that time. So the organizations that are known and trusted are really key, school districts as well. Um, at the county level, the staffing and preparing the, the uh, EOCs, the emergency operations centers, and then training with regional partners and doing the drill. Um, and then also, again, on some of the, the water sustainability work, because that's that that water security piece. And, and uh, um, Commissioner Phil is, uh, Commissioner Chang is doing that uh, here in, in Central Oregon. So on the city, if you want a really full analysis, we actually, before I left, the June 23rd, um, we had a town hall. And there's a really in-depth packet on an analysis of what happened in in talent and also a bunch of lessons learned. So, and, and also how communities and individuals can prepare themselves. So I'd really actually, uh, you just go to the, the city of talent.org and look at the, um, the June 23rd, uh, 2021 town hall on wildfire recovery. Uh, there's a, a big packet with a lot of information in there that people can turn to. Another couple of things on, uh, for cities to think about though, make sure your municipal code has a process for responding. The city of talent did, and that allowed us to just kind of kick it off that process and then actually uh, move forward. And then also it allows for emergency measures. And so when I was in talent, I was able to um, essentially sign an executive order that allowed for emergency, temporary emergency housing throughout the city. Uh, Phil talked about the land use restrictions. That's part of Oregon land use law. And during times of emergency, you need flexibility so you can take care of those basic housing people and temporary shelters as you're working to get that long-term uh, housing established. Um, and then also for individuals, I think having that, that one of the big takeaway and lessons learned is that it it's not gonna be, you know, no one's gonna snap their fingers and, and the cavalry is not showing up to protect you. So having your own family be ready, you know, signing up for emergency alert, um, getting involved with the, the CERT, with community emergency response teams or establishing it in your community if it's not there. Again, the state provided funding for, for talent to establish that because talent didn't have it, Ashland did. Um, so that's a future opportunity in, in, in Southern Oregon. Um, know the safety routes, uh, have a family plan, have your go bag ready. You know, my, my, uh, my since past old uh, Polish grandfather was right, always have a half a tank of fuel in your car. So all, all those kinds of things, um, having food and water, assuming that when there's an emergency, you're able to respond immediately is really key. Uh, kind of ironically, after coming back home in, in July, later that month, there was a, a wildfire. The Grandview fire was just a couple um, a couple miles uh, west of us. And had the wind been blowing the normal direction, we would have had to evacuate. And so having to go from the working town to having to pack our own go bags and, and go through that experience was uh, made it real what, what a lot of folks I work with and, and Terry, your experience as well. I'll also just flag that we're talking about wildfire. But um, this is really a conversation about all types of emergencies. You know, there's wildfire, there's earthquake, there's flooding, ice storms, excessive heat, excessive smoke. Probably everyone in this call has experienced some of this even in the past year or so. Uh, flooding, hazardous waste spill, and then, uh, you know, God forbid, an active shooter. So there's different responses that are appropriate, but there's also being ready um, and being prepared to respond to something is, is really, really key. Um, so, you know, there's a, it all starts at the local level. The city has to respond. Uh, smaller cities have that challenge of not having typically a lot of staffing. So really rely on volunteers, people stepping up and helping out. And then of course, even in what happened in talent, and I wasn't there at the time, but that emergency response in that moment was to uh, get people out. There was just literally a few minutes to get to evacuate almost a third of the city. And that's you know also uh, largely farm worker and seniors on fixed income. So really kudos to all those, uh, the staffers and the community members who stepped in to help get that done. Um, and the, the first responders who helped to, to save lives. Um, but helping those who will help you is a real key part of the preparation. We're kind of, Karina, do you have something to add to this from the, the tribal perspective, from what's happening at Warm Springs? 
I mean, I feel, <laughs> I'm just listening and taking everything in, but I think, you know, just to piggyback off of it, my perspective is just really different because it is about travel community specific. And so everything that's being talked about, I think a lot of our families are used to already like doing fire stuff on our own. I mean, like a lot of us grew up knowing how to dig a line. We've always had wildfires, but again, they've increased over the, over the years. And so just understanding that it's a bigger issue of, looking at systems changes and then the bills that has even been discussed now about how we're monitoring things or regulating things and understanding I guess it's just complicated because I don't want to get too much in the weeds but you know it's not just the tribal perspective but it's also looking at the Columbia River Gorge Commission and the forest uh, management of the National Forest Service areas and really looking at those mechanisms of how revenue is created from forest management or commercial sales in order to you know, do the work in those forests. And, and honestly, it's hard because, you know, I see in the chat, there's conversations about data, but being a tribal leader who worked with multiple agencies across the board, utilities and fire and government affairs on state, local, federal, that is always coming in and we're always analyzing it and we're always shifting and we don't always have the answers. And so sometimes, you know, and it takes a while sometimes to look at things from far away to see, oh, well, this caused that, this caused that, oh, well, this you know, it ruined this sale, it ruined these logs, but it helped these first fruits grow. And we don't always have the department or the resources to look at those things. So just understanding that the conversations we're having are so far away from being inclusive to all the communities we're representing that they're important, but you know, the people who are involved in, in, in organizations like Indivisible, we understand the importance of engagement, supporting candidates who are gonna push these sort of bills and do this sort of work. But we also need to be thinking about the communities like tribal communities, like BIPOC communities who aren't even having these conversations and how are they being impacted and what kind of more revolutionary policy can we be passing so that we're not sitting here saying, oh yeah, individual families need to have those individual responsibilities of getting ready to fight wildfires and be able to get out at any second because that's the reality of living in rural Oregon now, you know? And so it's, it is hard. I think like what Jamie said, we want to be able to hone in and say, here's ABC, here's what we can focus on, but that's not the reality. We have to focus on ABC and XYZ, you know, the little and the big. And so that's really all I had to, to add is it's a lot more complicated and we don't have enough time, but this work is very important and I appreciate everybody just engaging in this conversation deep diving. Yeah, I guess I'd like to point out, you know, we've gone from like the federal to the state, to the county, to the city, and we're down to individual responsibility now. And, and you know, we can touch on it from the Jamie's perspective, like having to go back. With, and I think all of my important things are still in boxes next to my garage door a year later, uh, only because there was smoke on the ridge here a couple of weeks ago. And I just brought everything down and put it by the door just in this automatic response, right? So there's that level, plus, you know, making sure that my house is prepared. Um, but there's also the individual responsibility of making sure you have elected official, officials in office that are doing the things that we need to do. I mean, once we've identified, you know, what needs to be done with the forest and what needs to be done with climate change and what needs to be, you know, done, we need to make sure that we are engaged in the political process to make sure that the people that are representing us are representing us and getting something done. Um, I'm going to throw that question, that, that statement out there and see what you say. <laughs> Terry, Terry Ed, before we go into that, I just wanted to touch on something that's bubbled up in the chat that I feel is really important okay. um, with Phil and Roger talking about these two different levels of science and how we look at these fires. One being, you know, there's nothing we can do uh, no matter what. One being, no, we need to clear. And it's a yes and situation. Both those things are true. The kind of work that Phil's talking about doing in local mitigation is incredibly important for fire starts for things in these small communities. Um, when we talk about fires like Paradise um, and the bootleg and the Dixie fire that's just still not contained yet, that's when a fire gets to a point where it's really a conflagration and it's um, there is nothing that will stop a fire like that other than bare dirt weather. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to just clarify because I saw a little bit of tension there, like both of those things are correct. There, there are ways that we have to reframe our thinking about that. And at the same time, we have to acknowledge that those are the ways that we empower communities to take control of their situations. Uh, but yes, I'm sorry to derail from that, but I was like, oh, I want to address that before, um, before that squirrel runs up the tree. <laughs> And if I can just add one other point to that, really appreciate the point made of the, the and piece. And then also often for our studies that we look back historically what's happened, 
we going forward, it's going to be all different. We can't rely on looking back to, to inform us how we'll go, how things should be going forward and how the new reality that we're in. And so I mentioned the mega drought early on. Um, we are now in a place where our systems are so fragile that even something that, you know, 20 years ago would have happened, would have been a small fire or, or would have been more in the quote unquote normal range is no longer the normal range. And so, um, so Terry, you're keeping things by the door. I mean, part of that is your PTSD and part of that is the reality that we are now in. Um, and, and one of the other things is, is and, and Karina touched on this in terms of systems and how we think about things. One of the things I didn't mention, another uh, organization I'm involved in is OWEB, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. And we're looking at building healthy watersheds. And part of that now is in our thinking is both, uh, how is this impacting in terms of natural resources? How, how is vul uh, fire vulnerability? And we just at our last board meeting reallocated some money and actually down in Southern Oregon to help address some of these issues. It, it was response to wildfire. And then also, how are we engaging kind of non-traditional communities? So the environmental community has been strong for many years, but it has tended to be kind of white, progressive, middle class, more a more affluent community who's had kind of the luxury of focusing on it. And we've got, you know, we look at talent, it was largely farm workers who were impacted by it. So how are we engaging other partnerships and building other partnerships to really engage in our learning and, and set the stage to be successful in the future? And 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 like uh, uh, like uh, uh, Dasha said, I, I apologize for taking us off. Terry, I thought you had a great question, but wanted to, I think those points needed to be, to be mentioned. Thank you. If I could, if I could actually put those two things together, that the question that Terry asked and the, the tension that, that they should have mentioned, we see, I mean, it is the politics of wildfire that drives the different strands of science that, that we see. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I have, you know, I, I have a, I have an MS from uh, the, the Environmental Sol Science Policy and Management Department at UC Berkeley, so you know, I have, I have a fairly um, environmental, uh, environmentally oriented uh, educational background, but I, you know, and and you know, I have an M and I have an MS, but I know that scientists' beliefs can shape the questions that they ask, the data that they collect, selectively collect, and the conclusions that they come to. Um, and there are, there, are, um, there are people in the, in the forest science community who inherently uh, believe that there is, you cannot positively manage a forest that any time a human touches a forest, you've spoiled it, you've made it worse, you've wrecked it. Um, and I can tell you that um, I know lots of people who have the same vision that I have for our forests, you know, a, you know, a, you know, a, a large old tree dominated forest with, you know, that's with widely spaced trees and, you know, an herbaceous understory which is what existed here for millennia. Um, there are lots of people who know how to produce that or to accelerate the recreation of that with heavy machinery, chainsaws, and drip torches. Um, and so I, 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 get, I, I, do get, I get pretty frustrated with um, the anti-management the anti scientists who selectively ask certain questions collect certain kinds of data so that they can come to a, a conclusion that reinforces their belief that humans can only do bad in the forest. Um, and uh, I, can, I can name for you uh, a whole bunch of dry forest you know, ecosystem scientists, uh, Dr. Jerry Franklin from UW, um, Paul Hesburgh, uh, you know, Tom Spees, uh, 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 there's a wonderful PhD, OSU PhD um, student who's done a tremendous amount of detailed work here on the Deschutes National Forest and the Ochoco National Forest named Andrew Marshall. Um, and, you know, there, there, there are a whole lot of, um, there's a whole lot of scientific perspectives on this stuff. 
so I just because you know um, Chad Hansen puts out a study, it does not mean that he has the definitive scientific um, uh, um, findings on on these issues. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of debate, and um, uh, again, uh, this is well, the politics of, of these issues. The belief so there you have you have people who believe you know you can't touch the forest, you know you can only do bad. They're going to say it's all about climate change. Like there's nothing we can do in the forest. We have to fix climate change, and fixing climate change is extremely important. Um, then there's the other people. There are, you know, there are there are active management people who are just loggers in disguise. I mean, there's people who want to get at the wood, get at the saw logs, and who don't like when you push them. They don't want to deal with the stuff that doesn't have any commercial value. They don't want to deal with the brush. They don't want to deal with the small trees. Um, and they would go in and you know and say that they are you know removing fuel and take take big saw logs out and leave us with the crap that really is the, the, the risk in our, in our forests. Um, so yeah, absolutely. There's people who, there's people who are, um, you know, trying to lead us astray, I'd say, in both extremes of the, the political spectrum. And that's the problem. Um, and, and then what we see is elected officials having to basically choose to either identify with one or the other when it's both. I was gonna point that out because really and truly we come up with this science and science, I'm not a scientist, um, big big exposure here, but I'm not a scientist. And I look at all these things and it flies over the top of my head and I'm thinking, I'm hoping somebody smarter than me knows what to do with this information. But then I look at these people that we've elected like to Congress, um, <laughs> I'll be honest here. You know, are are they are they smart enough to get this? I mean, they're they're trying to make these big decisions on what's going to be done with our land around our homes and around our communities, um, and we're hoping that they get the science right. Um, if we don't, but you know, that's asking a lot of them too. Um, on, from personal perspective, I'm more of a social scientist. I'm 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 looking more at how people are impacted by this, and I want to circle back to the PTSD element of this, um, in that there these fires impacted a trim, not just the community and you know when you went when you drove through talent for example it looked like a war zone it truly looked like somebody had hit it with a with a bomb um, for miles um, but what I found in, in talking to the people that live in my community here was that they've been impacted Ever since, for the last year, for example, they are they are afraid. There's there's a fear factor, and you didn't have to lose your house to be afraid, or your business to be afraid. Um, people that I know that live up my canyon here that that will say, you know, I still wake up in the middle of the night saying, "Is it now? Should I look out my window?" Um, and and afraid that they're going to have to flee at any minute. You've got that kind of impact on the people that live here. Plus, seventy percent of the kids in the elementary school down the street from me lost their homes. So you had kids that lost lost their schools because of COVID, they lost their, their homes and their friends and they had to move and, 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 and pick up and leave and go someplace else. They lost everything pretty much in their lives except perhaps their families. And we're, we're gonna have a whole generation of people, I know down here, that are gonna be impacted by this from a mental health perspective, from a uh, how they view the future perspective. I'm just wondering, that's what I learned from this fire was that the impact on every single person, whether they lost their home or not, was huge. So what did you learn, the four of you, after this fire season of last year, something you didn't know before that you went, wow, this is new information to me? Who's first? Well, I'll, I'll jump in because I'll, um, I'll echo what you said, Terry, and literally having been in war zones when I first went to Talon after, uh, in Phoenix after, after the fire, it looked to me like a war zone. It reminded me of Bosnia and Kosovo after the, after the war. Um, you know, some of the some of the takeaways uh, that I had, it was really it was kind of unimaginable, I think, to a lot of folks. And even with cities and their planning, you've got to almost imagine the unimaginable. Um, it also goes to that point of both. I mean, you know, Phil and and um, uh, and Roger, you know, both uh, scientists and really focused and, and studied in this in this issue. Uh, it is 
it is forest, but it's also the people in the, for, in the forest and, and how we prepare ourselves, how we prepare our homes, where we put our homes and, and can we get out in time? And then that, that um, yeah, I mean, to your point, Terry, I remember when the fire was, is in this area, I like every hour I was waking up and checking where the, you know, if we were now in the evac zone and, and as it was moving towards us kind of thing. Um, and the, yeah, the stories of kids crying themselves to sleep and that loss of sense of home and that sense of security and sense of community is, is huge. So, you know, the lessons learned based on my time and talent was really, yeah, imagine the unimaginable. And frankly, talent blows away both your, uh, your arguments on forest because a lot of the fire went along, it was mostly blackberry bushes. So it wasn't even forest uh, that it followed. And, and, and it was incredibly hot and incredibly windy and it was totally unexpected. And it was, you know, within, within less than an hour of when it started, but people literally had minutes to evacuate. Uh, being prepared is really key. So depending on your role, if you're a if you're a, a city manager or a county manager, or, you know, if you're in the staffing role at the state level, it doesn't matter what level, preparing your team, knowing roles, knowing responsibilities. If you serve on a city council or serve in an elected role, you may have a, a formal role. So knowing that role and being prepared and, and doing drills and being practiced in that is really key. Um, having your plans up to date, you know, doing all those best practices, um, making sure your systems are available, communication is the bottom line. One of the big takeaways in, in Southern Oregon, and, and Terry will probably speak to this, is that fear of like, we didn't know. Well, one, it happened so quickly. And then in the, um, the AR, the, the after action report for, the, for Jackson County, there was a sense of, you know, the city of talent and others didn't communicate effectively in time. Now, you know, there's a whole, that's a whole other conversation, but it's how do you even communicate amongst staff? So you had first responders coming in and how do they communicate with each other? I'm sure, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sure, um, you know, I'm sure Daisha could talk about that. What do you do when you're a firefighter in that situation if you lose communication? So do we have equipment in place? Um, do you have redundant systems? So one of the big conversations we were having in talent was, okay, for the next time, what if the power goes down? What if, you know, if everyone's calling on their cell phone, you can't text because those systems jam. So do you get a sat phone, a satellite phone? So how do you make sure your systems are in place, your communications in place? Um, how do you help people prepare? How do you communicate with your community ahead of time, during and after? And again, you know, as folks know, in, in talent, we turned around and made sure that documents were being translated into Spanish, that town halls were, that were, there was interpretation so that, that that uh, government could be accessible to the communities who are most impacted. All of those things, I think, are, are factored in and our takeaways in terms of how to prepare ourselves. And, um, it, but the biggest thing was the, you know, imagine the unimaginable because, and be prepared for it. Thank you. Desha, you have something that you learned from last year's incredible wildfire season? <laughs> oh, lots. Um, I think, the thing I just want to touch on is how resilient Oregonians are. And I know that sounds like the perfect politician answer right now, but <laughs> um, I really saw a side of people in these fires. I mean, that that it doesn't matter if you have a D or an R by your name, fire doesn't give a rat's hiney who you are or where you live. And people came together in really remarkable ways. Firefighters came together. We're not a monolith, that's for sure. Um, and and effectively, you know, responded in the best ways that we could. And that is, you know, a lot of folks say, how do you <laughs> in politics in, you know, and I, I have a background as well, Phil, in environmental science and emergency management, like how do you retain your hope in all of this? And I think out of, I mean, it's very much a Phoenix thing, but out of the ashes is is the hope for this, that we do start you know, there's conversations that have happened out of this on what, you know, what populations aren't we serving? What haven't we received out of this? Everything. And then you add COVID on top of this and you add the ice storms that we had on the West side here and you've laid everything bare. And so I really feel like my learning point from this is we're at ground zero and we have an opportunity before us to build something that hasn't been done before. And we're gonna falter and we're gonna stumble and we're gonna argue about the science, but we're gonna move forward because it's the only, the only thing that we're able to do. So I'll keep it at that, but there's so much learning. Thank you. Karina. I think just thinking about what we're talking about, not just this last fire season, but the last several and looking at emergency management plans, 
for the tribe and communities in this rural area and just really seeing the discrepancy in actual resources that are available to some of these smaller communities and just um I guess that's what's been the most shocking to me I mean that's the question and so it just comes back to everything that folks have been talking about about individual resiliency but also thinking about again you know how are communities who are in these areas and very vulnerable being supported in those situations that we know are inevitable where wildfires are going to come and surround are there decentralized utility services is there access to water are people going to be able to survive for the community of warm springs those answers are no there's not always access to water there literally isn't always water running out of these pipes and so just the reality of some of the ways that these systems were not just set up it's not just that they're set up to fail but they just it's clear that there wasn't intent and so how do we have these bigger conversations about it and be able to touch on everything and I do want to say that I think it was important what Phil's talking about you know as a as a former tribal leader you have a lot of different experts and scientists and people who are published and people who have data and facts that can put it out but it is skewed and we do need to understand the intention and the history and the um, position of people and what the work that they're doing as we're as we're analyzing it as individuals because there's so much information out there and I think what's the most frustrating for me someone in the chat mentioned that you know their local representatives are climate deniers and so for me I actually did run for the state senate in 2020 and that is because of the walkouts and that's because you know I sat in an office with Cliff Bentz when he was appointed to be my senator and we talked about transportation, we talked about wildfire, we talked about climate change, and he could have those conversations individually from a fact-based level. But when it came to actually doing the bigger conversations and the policy work, there was just not, it wasn't there and he wasn't showing up. And so that's where I'm saying for communities like mine, you know, we can't get into the weeds of all of the ways that law history and federal policy have set tribes up to fail. I mean, I can, but not on this panel. What I can say is that we need to really start attacking the bigger picture and supporting the experts who are elected, who have these backgrounds, who have the boots on the ground, who understand and have looked at the data and listened to what they're saying. Because there's a reason that they're in here and elected to represent us. And there's a reason that they're doing this work. It's to, they're doing good work and they're gonna back it up with the science. And so for me as a former leader, I think I, it's so hard hard not to get all mixed up, but that issue of cognitive dissonance and that issue of all being on the same page in these rural communities, it's a real thing. And for people like me, it has to be addressed and it has to be talked about, or we're not going to make any sort of movement that will have any sort of change in my lifetime. And it is necessary for us. So I, yeah, that's a getting off topic as well as the theme. No, and it, brought, it brings me to another really good question, but I want to give Phil a chance um, to answer the question as well in terms of what you learned. I mean, you're somebody with a big, broad background in all of this. Is there something in the past year that surprised you, something that you learned about uh, from the wildfires themselves? Um, uh, among these panelists, I'm, I'm the person who did not have to deal very directly with one of the major catastrophic fires of, of last year. Uh, we well, we somewhat dodged the bullet last year in Deschutes County. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I have much to offer, you know, in terms of kind of, you know, like intense experiences, you know, leading to transformational insights. But um, I, it, it was sometime in this last year when, um, when this, this idea that, that houses are fuel that can, that can transmit fire from one plate, one, from point A to point B, uh, really made made sense to me, um, or really uh, I, I really absorbed that because you know I've I've spent uh, you know decades working in the forest, um, but um, it doesn't have to be a tree that transfers uh, fire to your house. It can be the house next door, um, and and uh, that has uh, definitely you know, that has. Um, increased my interest in, in things like that, those provisions in SB 762 um, that are that are going to require the most wildfire resilient building materials possible for, for new homes. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, the other the other thing that I, I think um, everybody already, you know, understands, but um, which, you know, I'll emphasize again is, is that um, there are there are things that we can do to reduce the probability of loss. Um, we can we can build a resilient house 
We can do defensible space around our home. We can, uh, we can uh, address fuels in the forests or in the rangelands surrounding our, our, our community. Um, but when the, when the winds, the humidity, uh, the temperatures, the ignition are, are, are right, um, there is nothing uh, that you can do to, um, you know, to, to prevent loss. Um, it's, uh, you know, fire is, is far more powerful um, than our uh, human hubris um, allows us to comprehend sometimes. Uh, but there's, there is, uh, there are in the most extreme situations, which have, you know, like a small probability uh, but in those most extreme situations, there is nothing you can do. Unfortunately, with climate change, that, that small probability around those most extreme situation, uh, conditions is getting bigger. Um, but those are, the, those are the situations where you, you need to have your go bag and be ready to go. I used to love to watch lightning um, storms out my window here. I have this beautiful big six by six foot window in my house that I would sit and watch the lightning storms. And uh, that, that isn't fun anymore for me at all. I mean, you realize it just changes your whole perspective on the world after you've gone, if you've seen what a fire can do. Um, and there's nothing, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Um, my last question here is, is there are a lot of people on this call here tonight that are not living in uh, dry canyons like me or in rural settings and are, and are, and are watching this from, you know, perhaps more urban settings tonight. And they've asked, you know, what can we do? I mean, what can we do to, to help this situation? What can we do to help the people who have gone through this? Um, and I kind of wanted to put that out there because there are people that, I mean, I, there was, there were people that like gathered supplies and brought them down from the, the gorge, for example, to, to Southern Oregon and things like that. But what can we do now to actually make a difference going forward? Uh, who wants to take that first? I can jump in as the urban legislator right. <laughs> in those communities. Um, I really want to echo something that Jamie mentioned before. She mentioned my favorite other word, which is earthquake. Uh, and all these urban communities here, the you know we we are facing the largest catastrophe. Um, that we've never seen, or we haven't seen in the last 300 years anyway. And so that individual level of responsibility, but really transforming the way we think about emergency manage, the way we think about communities, instead of zip codes, and instead of like, who lives where, it's, it's what communities and, and where do we, how do we meet them where they're at. So that goes, you know, I, I can tell you as a firefighter, anytime there's a large fire, even in Washington County, we have donations start pouring in. And that can be really hard. That can actually hamper the functioning of a fire department. So um, that's just an aside. But be active, you know, take accountability. You talked about developing CERT programs. Really, it, it all starts, the building block is the community that you live in and the people that you know and that are in your neighborhood and how do you create those, how do you empower those community groups that are on the ground. And that's, you know, that's across the board from fire to earthquake to social justice, I mean, and, and heat wave response, all these things that we're doing. Um, but yeah, there's, and I, I think it's great that there's so much passion out there. And then the other thing is how do we tackle big things like the climate crisis. And right now we're seeing that in Portland with the Zenith, um, Zenith oil terminal conversation that's happening. So, so make your voice heard, stand up for that, say, no, we are in the urban environment because what happens here affects the rest of the state as well. So find your access point to that uh, level of activism and caring and whether that's joining a CERT team or writing to your city council and saying, I demand that we have a just climate future and we don't allow this to continue. That's important. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead, Phil, were you gonna say something? I would say kind of sorry. I want to apologize for my earlier rant, but I would I would go back and say, um, beware beware of polarization. Um, people who try to make 
a situation polarized and and make you know one side you know absolutely right and another side absolutely wrong um are probably not giving you the full picture thank you jamie uh thanks and i Karina, let me have you had the last word on on this um i think to the point of encouraging your representatives to also recognize and value the kind of resources like the bill that was that was passed uh, recently that recognizes and provides resources for when these kind of crises arrive. Um, tackling climate change is going to be huge, but realize that we have to translate that to get to Phil's point so that we're not creating conflict, but we're creating a path forward. And sometimes we're talking about the same ideas, but just finding different language to talk about it so we can build up the alliances we really do need to to, to solve the big problems. And on the, the small ones, um, you know, it could be everything from if depending on the size of the catastrophe, people may need the housing may need some of these other resources that are available so it can really run the gamut it's really specific to to the area um but encouraging your representatives to recognize and, and build partnerships and and identify some of the things that can be done um and then also recognizing some of those ongoing problems karina mentioned before and and many of the folks on this call know that um uh, Warm Springs has not had running clean drinking water for now several years. So there is that immediacy and response. There's the preparation work that needs to be done, but there's also recognizing vulnerable communities that are not being taken care of now and making that a priority. Uh, looking at the, the Latinx community, the farm worker community, making sure that those investments are made, those organizational investments are made now so that communities are ready to, to pivot and, and prepare. Um, one of the things that that happened, uh, we saw happen um, down in Southern Oregon around the, the wildfire, even when emergency response was coming in from the state, working with our, our Latinx community in Southern Oregon, it was actually an organization in Portland was funded and they subbed with our, our uh, Southern Oregon organizations. It was a Latinx organization in Portland, who I'm sure does fabulous work in Portland, but it was really inappropriate for that funding to go to just because it was a Latinx organization doesn't mean it's a the communities are monolith throughout the state. And so the investment, so those dollars go to, to local communities and invest in that organizational development is really, really important. So that understanding that thinking, and I wanted to, um, you mentioned at one point, Terry, the, the reps, Senator Jeff Golden and Representative Pam Marsh were phenomenal did amazing work, really brilliant, really community-based. We're very much, how can I help on a regular basis? Um, so having representatives that go to that and understand that, that also ties into uh, Terry's other question about representation does matter. And, and then uh, folks, I've been really fortunate to work with some amazing folks. Karina mentioned that she ran before. Uh, she would have been my state senator. We, Cass and I worked very hard to try to make that happen because uh, voices like Karina's are really um, uh, voices of great wisdom. And with that, Karina, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I mean, I think, you know, just to go off the points, if we're talking to people who Uh, Karina, you went off, and that's your, your your little one in the background. But that's a wonderful sound. But you're on mute. Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, my son is out here, and it's getting dark. Um, I think I just want to piggyback off of you know the things that people are talking about that we just need to continue to build to be on the same page to expand our conversations. But if I'm talking to people in urban areas, just understand that the conversations look different in rural places. And just as an ind in indigenous woman who grew up out here in a rural school district, in a conservative district, you know, we're not just fighting to learn and to process the new data that's always coming in. We're fighting to unlearn a lot of the norms that have been bestowed upon us. And when it comes to things like wildfires and economy, that does mean that we grew up with parents who worked in labor industries that might not have been the best for the environment. So we're unlearning a lot of these legacies. So we need that help and we need that support, not just literally in these conversations with people showing up and hearing what we're talking about, but also in the way that we're supporting campaigns and candidates and putting, shifting our power into areas where it's a real battle to just be represented, not a battle for candidates to have the most absolute aligned values like it can be in urban areas, which is great, but we just want representation and to not be so alone in these areas because once we get more representation out here who will work off of fact and data and science and look at the bigger pictures and not be in it for individual or corporate interests or needs, 
then we'll start changing on the statewide, the region, all those sort of things faster. So that's why I was involved. That's why I'm so thankful to the panel members, to this organization, because this is all power building and all of it matters. But just remember that for my, for me and my life, it's been to just find my voice and exist. And that's the reality of a lot of these rural communities. So we need that help. We need that support. We need that attention paid. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Karina. I'll point out that um, part of uh, COIN has, has a variety of teams. One of them is called the BAT team, which is the Bent's Accountability Team. Um, and one of the things that we met with him, he's actually met with our team twice and he's asked, um, you know, tell us what you want for infrastructure. So we did a survey of indivisible members across District 2 and the number one um, issue that we identified was water at Warm Springs. I mean, it was kind of a unanimous thing. Everybody said, yeah, we, if we're going to do anything, we need to fix that first. And so it was identified by us. Um, but at the same time, it's like, what do we do except advocate to our congressman to say, hey, you know, you've got to fix this. You've got to help fix this. You got to make sure it's a priority when you go to Congress. Um, and I would hope that um, the people at Warm Springs and some of these other communities that aren't as well represented um, on all the levels of government would reach out to indivisible groups because we are here. Um, we are, I will say we are a force. Um, having 45 groups across the state, we, there are tens of thousands of us. Um, Bence, when we called, he's met with us twice and as, as uh, Merkley said, that's a brave man. Um, and that's true because, <laughs> because we're a force to be reckoned with. Um, and I'm just gonna say to all of you that are looking for ways to get involved and for ways to make a difference, there are indivisible groups across the state that need your help, that need your, your expertise, that need your time and energy. Um, right now, my own group has just started a We Care campaign to start bringing snacks and Gatorade and stuff to the local healthcare workers at our hospital. I mean, the issues that we deal with every day. I mean, just tell us what you need. And, and an indivisible group, a lot of times will just put their hand up and say, okay, we're with you. But we need as many of you behind us as we can. We need more people to help. Um, and this, the next thing I'm going to say um, is, for heaven's sakes, run for office. Okay, even the little ones, the school board, the soil district people, the you know, the, any, all those little things, they need people like you that care to get involved and to help make decisions. Um, some of us have run. It's a scary thing, right? Um, and and it's, it's one of those things when you put your hand up, you go, what have I done? I'm now a candidate and, and I've never done this before and it feels really weird, um, but it's a really good experience. Please step up, even if it's the, the smallest one, the library board, anything you can just to get out there, get your, your foot in the door somewhere so you're helping to make decisions. And then if you really like it, you're going to work your way up through the ladder. And pretty soon we're going to have people that like us that care at all these levels so that when we talk about wildfire, we've got more of us out there that are doing the right thing and listening to science and, um, and listening to all of you um, give your opinions tonight. I want to thank everyone, please, for coming. Um, I want to thank our four uh, panelists for being awesome and teaching us and about this, this issue. Um, I hope that we can continue this conversation. I know there's so much more to do. An hour and a half is not enough. Um, but I'll let you at least have a, just a final um, a minute or so just to, to give your final thoughts. Daisha, you want to start? Sure. Thank you. Uh, I just, this is a phenomenal conversation. I'm so grateful that Ariel reached out and invited me into this space. Um, and we need to keep these going forward. And, you know, Phil was talking about, I have my, my prop here. I've been reading this book, just came out. Amazing book. There's a podcast called Life with Fire that has a variety of different sign, um, folks, you know, just Immerse yourself in what interests you and yeah, run for office. But anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't ready to give my final thoughts. <laughs> I called on you first. I'm going to go out of order too. I'm going to go to Karina next. How about that? Okay, well, thank you again. And I hope this isn't the last time I get to meet with this group. Um, this has been a lot Anytime. of Anytime. We are having, we have a lot more conversations planned. So far, we've had them with Merkley and with uh, Wyden. Um, and we're just going to keep having them. And, and Errol keeps having these great ideas and the, the, the leadership team. Um, so yeah, we're just going to keep having more conversations. If you have ideas for them, send them our way. 
Well, the two things that I'm immersed in in my professional life are COVID and fires. And lo and behold, I came into the legislature at a time when that is dominated <laughs> by COVID and fires. Uh, so yeah, um, and for anyone that has questions or wants to reach out, my email is rep.daciagraber at oregonlegislature.gov. I'm gonna put it in the chat and I welcome, uh, I think my one of my staffers is on here. He's like, oh yeah. <laughs> we'll do that. So thanks again. And again, just such an honor to be here with Phil and Jamie and Karina. And I look forward to building more power and community with them. Thank you. Karina, any last thoughts? Um, just, you know, thank you everyone for being here on this Tuesday evening and talking about wildfires in a very broad and very specific way. And I always am very appreciative for Indivisible and just its existence. It's, uh, you know, earlier we're talking about rays of hope. And I think that all of you always remind me that there's a lot of people who are fighting for better things, even though sometimes it feels like you're alone out here. And so um, I'm just also honored to be a part of the conversation. And, you know, I could have spent probably two hours sitting here listening to each individual talking about their work, just their work. And so uh, thanks to the organizers. I know it's always nerve wracking to get things done. Um, and yeah, have a good Tuesday evening, everyone. Thank you, Karina. Phil. Last thoughts. I also just want to thank everyone for taking this time. Um, this is uh, clearly a subject that I, I care a lot about. So it's always really nice to, to talk with others who are uh, really interested in these issues. Um, I, I One kind of last thing I would say is, uh, you know, our, our Representative Graber mentioned uh, SB 762 and it really will have profound impacts in all of our communities across the state of Oregon. Um, and not just profound impacts, but profound opportunities. Um, somebody the other day just said, hey, you know, we run conservation corps here in, in Deschutes County. Like there's a piece of that bill that's, that's you know, meant to, you know, fund, you know, channel funding to conservation corps programs that do fuels reduction work, right? I said, yeah, I, I heard about that. They said, well, let's do that. Let's be one of the places that, that, that stands up one of those conservation corps. So, you know, I would, I would just encourage everyone to get familiar with that bill and, uh, and, you know, look at the goodies, look at the opportunities in there and make things happen for your community. I mean, similarly at the federal level, there's, there's neat things happening. Um, you know, uh, uh, the senators Merkley and Wyden were able to get into the infrastructure bill, you know, additional funds for, additional funds for um, uh, fuels reduction projects, funds for uh, for you power utilities to put their infrastructure underground so it doesn't set our, set our landscape on fire. There's some there's some really good things happening at the on the policy level that it, it will take you know dedicated community level attention to to operationalize and implement on the ground. So I, I just encourage everyone to get involved in that stuff. And um, we're having this conversation in August, right in the middle of the, the like the worst, you know, the, the weather's awesome this week, but this is the worst possible week probably of, of the entire fire season uh, typically. And um, I, I just, you know, while I'm encouraging people to, to look up what they can get involved in, um, I'd encourage people to, to do that all winter long. Because it's the work that we do now um, that's going to make us that much more resilient come next fire season. Thank you, Phil. And Jamie, you get the last word. Well, thank you. And I apologize for not saying this earlier, but I think I saw an article today that we lost a firefighter today. So I want to just pay respect to that individual and their family um, and thank them for literally making the ultimate uh, sacrifice for our community. So much respect to them. Um, we are in a time of COVID. Terry loved the comment you made about helping our, our uh, medical staff. So I did something similar um, in, in Ben, just uh, gave a call to make sure they were okay doing it and then dropped off some you know, Gatorade and some granola bars and all that other stuff so that our uh, medical professionals know how much we appreciate them. So back to that earlier question, responding and being present as the need presents itself. Um, we've got, um, we've in Central Oregon with, with the drought coming up, uh, we're seeing some potential uh, use of that to divide our communities. So um, an organization, individual is involved with Western justice, 
quote unquote, who was involved in Harney County and potentially in Klamath County, creating divisiveness is now in Central Oregon. So we're, we're keeping an eye on that. So people please stay engaged. Um, uh, redistricting is coming up. So all those things we do in terms of thinking long-term and then also really investing in emerging leaders. Um, so after I lost the primary last um, uh, uh, last year, we really ended up, got a lot of calls from rural Democrats who wanted help and shifted our time and energy into creating this thing called Team Jamie for Oregon. So my colleagues like Karina uh, really took the lead when I was down in, in Klamath and Ariel and, and Margaret folks were on this, uh, really stepped up. And we've really been focusing on supporting, especially BIPOC and, and, and BIPOC focused candidates to really change the face of, of leadership and really bring forward and promote um, those leaders that are helping us to have a better sense of who we are and reflect who we are as a community. I think that's critically important. So uh, we've got team, so, I, um, so if you need to contact me, just go ahead. I still use the old email of jamie at jamie for oregon and then also teamjamiefororegon.com is, is the work we're doing to invest in emerging leaders. And then lastly, uh, just a huge thank you to all of you. Um, uh, you know, Coin the Indivisibles did an amazing job uh, when I ran for Congress in, in 2018. I know a lot of folks really were kindly supported last year as well, but we do change change the narrative and change the face of things when folks step up and demand that accountability. And, you know, as I'm looking at names and faces on this call, you all do that on a regular basis in the community and you have an impact on a statewide level. So please keep it up. Keep up. It's a great show of love for, for community and your fellow Oregonians to, to do this work. So thank you all. It's been a real honor and privilege to work with you all. Thank you very much. Daisha. you're muted, dear. I just really want to say before we all get off this call that it's someone's birthday today. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh my God. Yeah, so happy birthday, Karina. You make Oregon a better place.